Good evening and welcome to the Township of Chatham Township Committee meeting for Thursday, October the 13th, 2016. Greg, has adequate notice been given? Yes, adequate notice of this meeting of the Township Committee was given as required by the Open Public Meetings Act as follows. Notice was given to both the Chatham Courier and the Morris County Daily Record on January 8th, 2016. Notice was posted on the bulletin board in the main hallway of the Municipal Building on January 8th, 2016. And notice was filed with the Township Clerk on January 8th, 2016. Thank you. Uh, in honor of Fire Prevention Awareness Week, we are privileged and honored to have uh, the men of the Chatham Township Volunteer Fire Department here this evening to present the colors. So with that, I ask everyone to please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Gallup? Here. Mr. Kelly? Here. Mrs. Schwartz? Here. Deputy Mayor Sullivan? Here. Mayor Reeder? Here. Uh, is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Moving on. We've got uh, two proclamations here uh, this evening. Uh, the first one we have is for National Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Uh, I think everyone may be aware of the fact that next Tuesday, uh, October 18th, here in the Municipal Building, we're going to be hosting a domestic violence awareness presentation uh, entitled Creating a Responsive Community, What You Can Do to Prevent Domestic Violence. Uh, we're organizing this talk. Uh, similar as we did earlier this year, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention with another great organization. That's the National Domestic Violence, I'm sorry, it's the Jersey Battered Women's Service. Uh, with us tonight, we have uh, Betty Inneroni. I Inneroni. I Thank you. So uh, I'll read this proclamation, and I encourage everyone uh, to attend our, our presentation next Tuesday. Whereas one in four women will experience domestic violence in her lifetime, and whereas more than three million children in the United States are exposed to the devastating effects of domestic violence annually, and whereas each year in New Jersey there are approximately 65,000 reported cases of domestic violence, including more than 2,000 in Morris County, and whereas everyone deserves a lot to live a life free from abuse, control, and fear of being hurt or killed by their partners, and whereas Jersey Battered Women's Service Mission is the prevention of domestic violence and its staff and volunteers have provided helpline services, shelter, counseling, children's services, batterers intervention, teen dating abuse services, community education, and professional, professional training to thousands of Morris County residents since its incorporation in 1976. Now, therefore, we, the Township Committee of the Township of Chatham, do hereby proclaim the month of October to be National Domestic Violence Awareness Month in our community and do hereby join the staff and dedicated volunteers of Jersey Battered Women's Service to raise awareness of domestic violence and to promote the Jersey Battered Women's Service's 24-hour confidential helpline, 1-877-RU-ABUSED. Betty, would you like to uh, come up? Oh. You guys want to come down? Oh, okay. <coughs> 
will present. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, our next proclamation is uh, in recognition of Fire Prevention Awareness Week, which hopefully everyone knows it's been this week, the 9th through the 15th. There's been a number of uh, activities in town. I know Green Village Fire Department had an activity last Saturday, and our Chatham Township volunteer firefighters have a, an event this weekend as well, and we'll ask the chief and some of the, the men to come up after the fact, but I'll quickly read this. Whereas the Township of Chatham is committed to ensuring the safety and security of all those living in and visiting the township, and whereas fire is a serious public safety concern both locally and nationally, and homes are where people are at the greatest risk from fire, and whereas U.S. fire departments responded to 369,500 home fires in 2014, according to the National Fire Prevention Association, and whereas U.S. house fires resulted in 2,745 civilian deaths in 2014, representing the majority, 84% of all U.S. fire deaths. Whereas in one-fifth of all homes with smoke alarms, the smoke alarms are not working. And whereas three out of five home fire deaths result from fires in properties without smoke alarms or with no working smoke alarms. And whereas working smoke alarms cut the risk of dying in reported home fires in half. Whereas many Americans do not know how old their smoke alarms in their homes are or how often they need to be replaced. And whereas all smoke alarms should be replaced <coughs> at least once every 10 years. And whereas the age of a smoke alarm can be determined by the date of its manufacturer, which is marked in the back of the smoke alarm. Whereas Chatham Township's first responders are dedicated in reducing the occurrence of home fires and home fire injuries through prevention and protection education. And whereas Chatham Township's residents are responsive to public education measures and are able to take personal steps to increase their safety from fire, especially in their homes. And whereas the 2016 Fire Prevention Week theme, don't wait, check the date, replace smoke alarms every 10 years, effectively serves to educate the public about the vital importance of replacing the smoke alarms in their homes at least every 10 years, and to determine the age of the smoke alarms by checking the date of manufacture on the back of those alarms. Now, therefore, I, Kurt Ritter, Mayor of the Township of Chatham, do hereby proclaim October 9th to the 15th, 2016, as Fire Prevention Week throughout Chatham Township. I urge all people of Chatham Township to find out how old their smoke alarms in their homes are, to replace them if they're more than 10 years old and to, and to participate in the many public safety activities and efforts of Chatham Township Fire and Emergency Services during Fire Prevention Week. One of our longer ones. Uh, Chief, you want to come down and say a, a few words and talk about the activities and all the efforts and we'll ask the men to come down for a picture. All right, uh, wrapping up this year's uh, Fire Prevention Week, we have an open house at our Station 2 on Southern Boulevard this Saturday. It's uh, going to be from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, there's a number of activities going on during the, uh, during the open house. Uh, communities more than welcome to come down and see the fire apparatus, meet the firefighters. You know, have some activities for, uh, for the children, some uh, giveaways, and uh, it's just a great opportunity to uh, promote fire safety in the community. So hope to see everybody there. Thank you, Chief, and uh, I think about half of the committee just want to thank you and all the volunteers, all the men who, who serve in our volunteer fire department uh, for your efforts. Uh, we'll talk about it later, but Tom Salvas has put together our latest perspective video highlighting both the Township and Green Village Fire Departments, and when you hear what these guys go through and the time and effort that they spend protecting uh, the residents of Chatham Township, it's truly remarkable. Uh, you know, there's a lot of volunteers in our community, and we're grateful for all of them, but I think 
having the volunteer fire department, uh, the unsung heroes for all that you do. And on behalf of myself and everyone here, I just want to say thank you for all your, all your hard work. Thank you, Chief. Thank Speaking you. Chief. Of of fire prevention. We had a discussion earlier this year about um, fire outdoor fire pits mm -hmm. and safety issues related to how close they should be to the house. Do you have any um, guidance for us on that issue? Do you have any um, concern on you know the abundance of outdoor fire pits in the relationship to these uh, closest to a house? Uh, I'm sure that the uh, the fire official Barry Howard has a little bit better knowledge of actual distances that might be required. Um, I know we've had some instances in the past where we've responded out to homes where the fire pits have actually been too close to the house, and we had one house in particular that the uh, the fire from the outdoor fire pit was actually licking up under the eaves of that of the roof, so the the house itself was being compromised because of the outdoor fire. Um, the best you know, the best option would really be to keep them at a safe distance away from the house and make sure that they're all covered. Um, the, the biggest danger as far as just outdoor fires in general is that you have the embers from a fire pit or a chimney or anything of that nature. It's just dispersing into the air, and especially when it's dry out, if those embers hit the ground, that's when you have your, your threat for an outdoor fire. So really just making sure that you have, you know, your burnt, you know, your fire pit, your chimney, and make sure it has some kind of screen or cover on it to prevent the embers. It's really an ember shield, but that's that's the best way to, to prevent the, the outdoor fires themselves. So the town developing some standards for that would be helpful to you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think having just some kind of standard would, uh, you know, going forward might, might help the, the residents and just kind of promote an overall fire prevention attitude, uh, you know, just developing that safe, you know, that safe recommended distance from the homes. Or a public awareness campaign perhaps as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, Chief. Thanks, Chief. Right. Sure. Gentlemen, want to join us? All right, moving on, we have uh, reports. Mike, you want to lead us off? Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. I want to start with a, a shock that I had uh, this week when I stopped by the Department of Public Works and, and found them putting snow plows on top of, on the, uh, on the trucks. Uh, manager Rich Young explained that uh, this is a procedure they go through every fall to make sure that all the controls are working and, and uh, nothing is uh, broken since last year, and then they, they do take them off again and wait for the first snow. So we're Halloween is only a couple of weeks away. <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple of unusual projects that the DPW has uh, undertaken this past month, uh, uh, repaving the parking lot and the driveways at the Little Red Schoolhouse uh, Historical uh, Museum. You prob probably noticed the, uh, the barricades on the driveways there, but that, that work is uh, done as of last week. And it looks great, uh, striped and uh, curbed and, uh, and paved. Um, another project that they're going to start uh, next week is a uh, uh, replacing, digging up and replacing a uh, drainage pipe at the uh, Rescue Squad building. So uh, they're, they're busy around the township on those kinds of things. 
and that's in addition to their uh, ongoing projects, uh, <coughs> painting the crosswalks, uh, filling the potholes, um, working on the catch basins, uh, replacing some broken guardrails uh, along roads in the town, and, uh, and, then, and then also maintaining the, the playing fields as well, the soccer fields and the, and the baseball diamonds. Uh, moving on to the Open Space Committee, um, they will be having a, uh, a short work session at the uh, Hillside Avenue Trails on uh, Saturday, October 22nd, uh, from 8.30 till 10, and then at 10.30 they're going to have a dedication ceremony for the uh, newly completed uh, figure eight trail there on Hillside Avenue. So any member of the public would like to stop by and check out the trail and, and also uh, be part of the uh, congratulations for that project, uh, please, at 10.30 on Saturday, October 22nd. And I believe that's it. Great. Thank, Thank you, Mike. You. Bob? No report tonight. Great. Sharon? All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, our seniors would like you to know that we are having our flu shot, annual flu shot clinic on uh, October 26th here at this municipal building from 1.30 to 3 p.m. These are uh, complimentary and recommended flu shots for all township seniors. We are also announcing the Shred event one more time. It's become increasingly popular. It's a great fundraiser and a great opportunity to get rid of a lot of our confidential documents. Uh, the Shred event will be held on Saturday. Karen, um, what's, the, what's the age for the, uh, for the uh, flu shot? For flu shot, well, I believe that seniors are 62. But you know what? I think if you went in there and convinced them that you needed a flu shot, they would be able to do that. I don't think they ask for ID. Uh, I'm not just, certain if it's on the honor system whether you have like, to... Just like voting. Huh? Just, just like, just like, like voting. voting. You don't need to show ID. <laughs> you can be whoever you want. Um, so on the... Uh, you can even get a flu shot twice. On that regard, <laughs> yeah. So how, come on and have a flu shot, Bob. Maybe they I've would believe you. I did too. Uh, so anyway, that's that. The Shred event is going to be on uh, the 29th. That's Saturday of uh, the end of the month. And that is at Lafayette Avenue School. Once again, that's a great fundraiser and a great way to get rid of your confidential uh, documents you may have lying around the house. Uh, we also will be conducting a rabies clinic at, uh, on November 5th from, 10, from 9 a.m. to uh, 10 a.m. And uh, all of our <clears throat> All of our dog owners are encouraged to attend. There will be more details on that. That's November 5th, so save the date. Our Environmental Commission is making great progress on their uh, safe drinking water event. That's scheduled for October 20th at Charlie Brown's from 7.30 to 8.30. We are uh, calling it Water and Wine. Uh, it's by no means calling into question the safety of the drinking water here in Chatham Township, which is tested and regularly passes for excellence. But there's much that's been said lately, written lately, and heard about safe drinking water. So we will have experts from several of our utilities, our, excuse me, several of our, uh, our resources here in the community. Uh, and so all are encouraged to attend. That is Water and Wine on October 20th. And also, uh, Your Honor, I had the uh, honor of attending a, law, a joint law enforcement, clergy, and community event at the Morris County Prosecutors uh, just this, uh, at the end of September regarding increasing awareness for heroin and opiate abuse, particularly among our young people. It is reaching epidemic proportions in many parts of the country. New Jersey is no exception. Certainly Morris County is no exception. And as much as we all cringe at the thought of heroin addiction, opiate addiction is running rampant in many of our communities. Uh, the, there were many, many clergy in attendance from around Morris County, as well as law enforcement, our prosecutors, et cetera. They are eager to be a resource for us. They're eager to be a resource in our schools, in our communities. And we will look further into having them give a presentation. It was powerful, it's frightening, and it's really not to be ignored. Uh, there's a sign we have here in our municipal building that says, would you give your children heroin for sports injuries? And it seems preposterous, and yet that is the same basis for a lot of our um, a lot of our pain treatments, even among young people, for sports injuries and recovery from surgeries, et cetera. 
So I look forward to hearing more from our community resources about it and hopefully getting them in here to give a presentation as well. Fantastic. And that's what I got. Thank you. No reports today. All right. Uh, just a few items. Uh, a recap. Uh, I think everyone's aware of it by now, but since we haven't informally announced it, uh, the suicide walk we hosted a few weeks ago was a tremendous success. Uh, we raised over $65,000 with over 550 walkers. We've actually tentatively scheduled our walk for next year on September 23rd. So thanks to all those who participated. The, the fire departments were there from Green Village and the township. Uh, many sponsors uh, in town, local businesses and such, and all the residents who participated. So thank you for making that a, a tremendous success for our inaugural year. And hopefully we'll get this uh, keep on this calendar for years to come. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Tom Salvis, our communications manager here in the township, uh, has done another phenomenal job as it relates to the next edition and installment of Perspectives. Uh, this is a series of videos that uh, we produce to pull the curtain back and give residents a look at uh, the volunteers and those who, individuals who work for the township itself. We've done one on the police department, DPW, uh, and this installment in conjunction with the uh, Fire Prevention Awareness Week is a, is a great one. So I encourage you all to visit the site sometime tomorrow or later this week uh, to see these great videos. Uh, I'll leave it for Tommy if you want to talk about the pre prescription drug uh, drop-off uh, that's coming up uh, in, a in a couple of weeks. And then just to reiterate our domestic violence uh, presentation next Tuesday the 18th, details are on our website. John? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just an update on, on some of the capital projects. The uh, Colony Pool um, re uh, wall replacement and, and Wickham Woods, the uh, the contract, both contracts were awarded to the same contractor, um, had a pre-construction meeting with the contractor and, and he's starting to do the, uh, the paperwork of submitting shop drawings so that we review um, the various materials that he's going to use to make sure it meets the specifications and is what we want. So that process is going on and, and he's anticipating starting um, towards the end of the month, um, uh, maybe within a week, but um, uh, he's, he's probably more likely towards the end of the month. So we'll see some activities there. On the uh, consent agenda, you'll see in, in one of the resolutions, there is a, a recommendation to uh, reject uh, the bids and authorize a rebid for the electrical work and, and the fuel storage tank for the municipal building. Um, we only received one bid, and uh, the bid was uh, higher than the grant amount that we received. So um, it may be a, a nice reflection that, that the economy is doing better, that we only had one contactor respond, but nevertheless, it, it was just one bidder. So I, you know, the recommendation of Tom and I was to, to rebid, and, and we're going to be a little more aggressive in reaching out to certain contractors that and, and just try to get more than one bid the next time around. Make it more competitive. And just to report on the, not our project, but the county. The county will be paving. Um, uh, Shunpike Road from Southern Boulevard to Noe, and then also a portion of, of Green Village Road um, starting at um, Southern or, or Shunpike and going towards uh, the first bridge that's located on, on uh, Green Village Road. Um, the work, it's my understanding, should <coughs> start on the 24th. Um, there may be some work beforehand doing some um, catch basin work and, and um, other uh, prep activities. Um, typically with the county, um, they usually do um, one-way uh, detours and having flagmen, and so they're not, they don't close the road entirely. Um, but there may be instances where they, they do close a portion of the road for a very short period of time just to allow movement of trucks or, or of that nature. Um, a concern was raised regarding they are proposing to start work at 7 o'clock. Um, so I, if, if the committee does want to push back a little bit and, and start later and have the contractors start at 9, we could request that to the county if that's a preference. Do the county typically start their work at 7, or is there an exception for this one? This or? is an exception for this one, so we can push. Yeah, in this particular contract, they did. A lot of times they, they do vary depending on the road. They do um, vary their times, and, and uh, most contracts, I've seen them coming out from 7 to uh, 5, but in this particular contract, it was from seven uh, from 9 to 5, so we can, we can request the county to hold them to that. Well, I don't know what everyone else thinks, but just considering the congestion already from morning commutes and, and school travel. Uh, okay, I'll reach out to the police and I'll let the county know that, that that's the, the, you know, the desire of the committee is to, to enforce at 9 o'clock. 
And is there other information? Are we going to put out a, a blast to residents or any kind of notification, so to speak? We can yeah, I, I will follow up with the police on that. I, I, uh, I didn't see it on our website uh, you know, today, but I'll, I'll follow up with them and make sure that the notification is out. Okay. Could you send me the material as well? We'll get on the website and yes. the uh, social media? Yes, Perfect. we'll do. Great, okay. thank you. So, John, let, let me just follow up that uh, with that. Uh, the county, this is a county project, and obviously they're taking care of some of the work that, uh, that New, Jersey, New Jersey American Water uh, did this summer uh, on Southern Boulevard. W people have asked, you know, what is the status of that? Obviously, we know it, it'll sit for probably till next year to settle, right? That's mm -hmm. the normal course of business. But much of it cuts down across the middle of the road. Will they be paving from curb to curb? Are they paving half the road? Are they paving the whole road? Where do we stand with that? They usually just pave one uh, lane. That's what they typically do, but that's but for the most part, they, they try to get the water main to be in one lane. So in those circumstances where they extend into the next lane, I'm sure they're going to extend beyond the lane and go into uh, that area. I haven't seen the paving plan, but that's what I've seen in other portions of the other areas of the county when, they, when the county allows them to extend the water mains. Okay. So, but it's not going to be curb to curb unless um, the county is is. Um, is going to work with them as a joint project, but uh, commonly the water company will only do the one lane. Great. Uh, John, if we can get back to the Sean Pike to Green Village Road paving project. Much was made over the last several months about the turning lanes, perhaps pedestrian safety, perhaps redoing some of the other uh, entry and exits around the Chatham Mall and Hickory Tree Shopping Center. Mm -hmm. Have those plans been readdressed? I imagine they have to be. And what kind of progress was made and what kind I, of configurations have, yeah, have we have, talked about? Yeah, I have not seen any updated plans uh, they, right at this point. And that, it's my understanding those are, are they're, they're short-term and long-term improvements that they're going to look at for that, for that intersection. And, and and the, the milling and paving is not their long-term solution, at least that's my understanding, is that they may doing, be doing other arrangements in that. And then usually some larger reconstructions, the county will, because it is a short section of paving, it's not a substantial amount in, the, in their whole paving scheme, um, to just to do it, get the road in, in good shape, and then plan in the future when they would do other improvements. Okay, so you said the paving is going to be from Noe to Southern Boulevard on Shunpike? Correct. And Correct. that's milling and paving of that road. Of that intersection. And then are they going, they're going from Southern Boulevard across the face of Hickory Tree and Chatham Mall and then on to Green Village? No, their note is said to um, Southern. So, so they're only going knowing? Are they going, are they going over? Well, Green, Green Village Road goes up Southern, right? They're not going across, they're stopping at the intersection. Okay, so okay great. Yeah. That's the next phase. The next phase is between Chatham Mall and Hickory Tree and then out towards Green Village. Okay. Because I know we had talked about restriping for different traffic patterns, et cetera. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that, that, I haven't seen those final plans, and, and uh, they're, they're, what they're doing is, because um, yeah, they, did, they did wrench in Southern. I haven't seen if they're going well beyond that intersection. Usually they'll go slightly beyond, but they may have cut it short. Got it. Okay. And, and as Kevin pointed out, of course, Green Village Road goes and then turns around and then goes. <laughs> yes. So, yes. Great. Thank you. Anyone else for John? <clears throat> Thanks, John. Tom, you want to say anything? Or? Sure. Just very briefly, next Saturday, October 22nd, we're going to be working in conjunction with the DEA and we're going to be holding a drug take back. It's going to be at two locations, one at police headquarters, 401 Southern Boulevard, and the second location is CVS, 641 Shell Pike Road. Thank you, Tommy. Appreciate it. Uh, and our other Tom is out sick this evening, uh, so no other reports. We'll move on to uh, the hearing of citizens. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to be heard about issues which are not topics scheduled for public hearings tonight to help facilitate an orderly meeting and to permit all to be heard. Speakers are asked to limit their comments to three minutes.
Good evening, Mayor and Committee. Rob Walden, Jersey Central Power and Light, 52 Chatham Road, City of Summit. Uh, two quick things to update you on. First, we've announced our capital budget for 2016. The capital budget for JCPNL in 2014 was $250 million. In 2015, it was $267 million. This year is $387 million, so a significant increase in our investment in capital projects. Much of that is we're beginning some transmission projects, substation and transmission line work, so that the budget is increased to pay for some of the preliminary work on those projects. Next uh, subject I wanted to bring up is we have another open house for our PSI Institute. As you may recall, this is our Lyman School. It is a two-year associate's degree in electrical work. We partner with Raritan Valley Community College and also um, a Brookdale Community College. We have an open house on November 10th at Raritan Valley Community College. We have a thousand folks retiring from First Energy each year, mostly linemen and substation workers. And we're looking to replace those with uh, young men and women who wish to have a good career uh, with Jersey Central Power and Light. We pay for tuition, we pay for books, we pay for equipment, we pay for all the clothing they need. Um, and then after they get their two-year degree, most of them find a uh, job at one of the 10 First Energy operating companies, including JCP&L. So again, there's an open house on November 10th at Raritan Valley Community College from 6 until 8 p.m. We encourage anybody who's interested to come and attend. And as always, I'll take any questions. Uh, thanks for being here, Rob. Sure. Can I ask you what kind of, I know we talked about rate increases last year. Do you anticipate further rate increases going along with this capital budget increase to our regular residents? No, we've, we've already, we made application to the BPU for rate increase in April of this year, asking for about a 5% increase, which would be about a 5 to $6 increase per month on a typical residence bill. We've not yet gotten hearings scheduled with the BPU. They will be coming up. Uh, shortly, we'll get those dates and we'll certainly put them out so folks know when they are. Um, but now once we have this rate case, we will not be going for another rate increase for some time afterwards, I would imagine. Right. Thank you. Sure. Rob, this may yes. be an unfair question off the top of your head, but okay. with, uh, with all those dollars for capital projects, are any of those projects in, in or near Chatham Township? All of them, sir. Each and every day. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know exactly which ones are going to be in Chatham Township. One of the projects we do have coming up is the Monfield to Whippany substation, or not, not substation, but transmission line. That transmission line will provide another uh, roadway for electricity to come into the substation that serve Chatham Township and much of Morris County. So that project, which we're beginning to spend money on and beginning to, to uh, work through, will have a positive impact on Chatham Township. But beyond those projects, I couldn't give you a, a specific number. When you were here a while back, there was a project that you were doing that had some pushback from a couple of towns. Is there an update on that? That was the Monfield Whippany project. We had a public hearing, and Monfield uh, was the only objector to the project, as well as some uh, residents. I think Monfield Township, the school, uh, that project is now uh, before the BPU, and we expect uh, to get approval for that uh, shortly. Great. Okay. Thanks, Rob, again for Thank uh, much. being such an advocate and coming out here and seeing your face here. It's, uh, it's great. I think. The relationship you've built with the committee here, especially Karen, kind of our utilities uh, liaison, uh, is commendable, and I wish we could do it with all the utilities, uh, but it's great. So thank you for being here again. Glad to do it. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Good night. Anyone else? All right, Greg, would you please read the consent agenda? This evening we have resolution 2016-191, payment of bills. 2016-192, approving meeting minutes. 2016-193, approving executive session minutes. 2016-194, designating an $800,000 uh, sewer utility bond anticipation note. 2016-195, authorizing submission of DOT grant application for River Road and Southern Boulevard sidewalk improvements. 2016-196, certifying continual ownership and maintenance of River Road and Southern Boulevard sidewalk project, 2016-197, adopting procedures manual for the use of federal funds, 2016-198, refunding overpayment of taxes, 2016-199, rejecting bids and authorizing rebid for electrical improvements and fuel storage tank. <coughs> uh, thank you. 2016-200, uh, authorizing the filing of a Green Acres program pre-application local park land major uh, dispose, uh, disposal diversion. Thank you, Greg. Does anyone have any questions on the consent agenda? I actually do. Um, if you could explain as a matter of procedure the um, refunding of overpayment of taxes to our disabled veterans, 
Is this something that these folks have to apply for, or is it information that's readily known? And uh, do you suspect, perhaps, that we have more folks in our community who are eligible for this repayment and this uh, refund, rather, and are not aware of it? Um, I honestly don't know. Um, it's you know, something that goes through the tax office. Uh, people you know, make requests. It looks like um, our attorney might have more information on that. I hope so. Thank you. It's a two-step process. Uh, first, the uh, Veterans Administration has to declare the veteran as disabled. Albert, excuse me, to switch on. It's a two-step process. The first step is the Veterans Administration has to declare the veteran disabled, and the veteran has to apply for that. Uh, the veteran notifies the, uh, the the administration notifies the veteran. The veteran, in turn, provides the documentation to the municipality, and the exemption is granted by the tax assessor. And if there's a refund for uh, from the effective date of the uh, classification, that's what you're you're approving on those refunds. So it is a first a federally driven, and then uh, locally uh, a local response to that federal determination. Great. If I could ask your opinion, do do you see this a lot? This, to my recollection, this is the first yeah. that I've seen of it. I haven't seen this before. Um, sure. Do you suspect that perhaps we have a greater population that might be able to avail themselves of this, or is it publicized? Is it something that's publicized through the VA? Is is I, a lot being made of it? Because I, I know in some of the other, there is a flyer that the Veterans Administration has. Uh, that I've seen in other municipalities in their clerk's office advertising that this and explaining what the procedure is. Uh, uh, I don't recall if this has ever happened here before, but I know in other municipalities that I represent it does occur as a matter of course. Uh, but it all depends on the veteran population. Mm -hmm. um, but I, as I said, I, I can work with the tax assessor uh, to have him get literature at least to the clerk's office to put clerk's office and if there's a brochure um, it, you can certainly uh, put it on your website that would be great I think um, we I, would I would like to look into that because I think that this is uh, something that we owe to our men and women in uniform who have ended up with their lives dramatically changed as a result of their service I have seen a number of these go through over the past several years so it's not yeah this is not by any means the first time this has happened great okay Thanks, Greg. Any other questions? I have a question. I was not at the last meeting. So I have a question in regards to this grant application for Southern Boulevard yep. sidewalk improvements. And I know John says it's in the uh, 2009 uh, walkway and bikeway plan, which I have a copy of here tonight. Um, I couldn't find it. He swears he can see it on his on his uh, on his yeah, cell phone. Yeah. So, but that's all right, John. My, I'll really show you. My at question the meeting, is, I'll show you. my question is is really a resolution 196, the the certifying continual ownership and maintenance of of, of the sidewalk. Um, and one, I asked that question because uh, is this a different kind of grant than the grant we uh, put forth for Lafayette? No, this well, it is a different. Um, funding or grant program, but it follows the same federal procedures that we have to follow. So it is a, a federal grant, and, and that same um, certification regarding ownership and maintenance was done for... Uh, it was. Yeah, that yes. was my follow-on question. Yeah, it was done. So we've actually certified that the, the, the sidewalks on, if they eventually get done on Spring in Lafayette, um, will be maintained by the township will be maintained from a, a structural standpoint. If, if the sidewalk heaves or cracks or it becomes a tripping hazard, we would replace it, but we would not be removing okay. snow. snow. No, there's no, snow removal yeah. is not part of it. Yeah, yeah. right. That's but the maintenance of it, of it is. Correct. So, okay, that, that, was, that clears up the first question. The second question I really have is just more about uh, the process. Uh, again, from a perspective, when I look at uh, Southern Boulevard Snake Hill, this is going to uh, proceed up Snake Hill. Uh, basically uh, crossing uh, two very, very dangerous uh, and busy um, uh, intersections uh, with lots of lights uh, and uh, yield ways and lights and moving parts. And it seems to start with no sidewalk and it seems to more or less end with no sidewalk. 
And when I look at the overall plan, when I look at the northern side of Lafayette, you know, would that not have been uh, the northern side of uh, Shunpike, I'm sorry, uh, from Lafayette to Cougar Field, where that sidewalk is particularly in bad shape? It's not really a sidewalk. I guess you'd almost call it a trail because uh, much of it is macadam. Uh, maybe that would have been a better piece to build out the connectivity. Um, and if we're going to do these grants, it's nice to have grants and say, the grant's available, let's go for it. But the, you know, all of these things come with uh, associated costs. Uh, and of course, is the perpetual cost of, of the maintenance uh, of this. So when we look at sidewalks, um, the, I, I just feel like there should be some you know, uh, organizational structure to them uh, not where they end, because we do have several sidewalks, as we know, that, that lead to nowhere in town, and they just kind of end. So if we're looking at putting in sidewalks, putting in the expense of these, uh, you know, there is, there is, there's no free lunch to these things, as we know. There's engineering costs and there's maintenance costs, et cetera, that go on and on. And we all like to say we're fiscal conservatives uh, when it comes to these things and spending money. So we have to look at it more, more closely with a little bit of scrutiny. And not that we want to be uh, against everything. Uh, we certainly don't need to be for everything either. And, and it's a question of how, you know, have, have, have we thought about where is the next phase of that walkway uh, if we were to put this sidewalk in, if this sidewalk was to go in? What is the next? And this goes on to what I said. It eventually becomes sidewalk creep where eventually the borough merges into the township and the township starts to look like the borough and the Chatham start to look like Lakeland or Cranford, no disrespect there, but, but you understand where I'm going. And, uh, you know, right, right now there's a sidewalk at the intersection of, of Fairmount and Southern and there's also a sidewalk um, that ends at River Road within the Chatham Glen development. And so the project would connect those two sidewalks. And so it would be, it's not a sidewalk to go nowhere, it's actually a sidewalk that's connecting two sidewalks, or at least one sidewalk that goes nowhere to River Road and then, and then it connect into Southern. So it, it would connect the, those um, uh, two and, and th this, this does fall in well with the, um, the grant criteria of, of how they judge it, of how you're, you're interconnecting sidewalks, how you're, you're bringing neighborhoods together, how you're, you, it's, it's uh, you know, enhancing pedestrian um, you know, movement. You have a large community that now can walk up to Southern Boulevard. You know, the, the, you know, can they walk to church? Can they just walk, you know, go for a you know, walk around the, the, the town? It just, that's, that's a connectivity that uh, is being presented in the grant. Um, uh, what also is proposed is, is improving safety aspects um, because there are people that cross on Fairmount that, that cross that, that intersection and, and to provide uh, pedestrian counters and, and enhance the safety in that intersection. And, and a third component of, of the grant is, is actually right along uh, Buxton um, uh, into, I'm not sure, did you see the photo that I generated, a photo simulation of, of just um, a, a decorative wall which had Sam Township on it. So it is, and it's, so we're, we're not only going for pedestrian, uh, but also for um, community uh, enhancement uh, grant also, so to, to build that wall. So, um, you know, that, that's the, the basis uh, of the grant itself. We, we can look at, um, other uh, maintenance aspects of, of, um, of sidewalks uh, under this grant, um, more so if, if it's going to uh, increase safety or bring it more in compliance with uh, the DOT and, and ADA standards. Um, another project that I initially suggested as another consideration to the administrator and the mayor was possibly on Fairmont to you know, look at the, that section of roadway where the sidewalks are, are all over the place and you know, make some uniformity there. Um, and, and that was another possibility to look at that sidewalk. Um, but we just looked at, and, 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 and I know we were, we're, we were kind of in, in disagreement with the 2009 and I have to show you the color map, but, but that, that, that is essence of when, when, at least when I initiate the, the grant program is, is I would first go to the 2009 plan and say, hey, this is what you know, we've talked about in the past. Why don't we look at this project, that project? which one is, it looks uh, um, you know, attractive for, fits the grant and, uh, and what's, what's practical and what's the need. And, and uh, you know, one of the suggestions that I had is perhaps we need to revisit the 2009 plan and make
make that a, a charter for the planning board in the near future to, you know, because it is starting to be dated and it doesn't mm -hmm. look that good. Mm -hmm. Well, as you and I discussed, I mean, you know, we have that property on Hillside, right, that we bought. And Mike had mentioned the, the trail network that was put mm -hmm. in there. If you look at that property, it extends all the way up to Fairmont uh, Drive, um, Fairmont Avenue. And you could take some pedestrian traffic uh, right across from, from the condos on River Road, up Hillside Road, which is a little bit less traveled, through the, through the property that we own, up to Fairmont, uh, no less a steeper walk than what you'll experience on Snake Hill Drive. And, and it would actually get you extremely close to uh, uh, Long Hill Drive and obviously make accessible the walkability to the high school. And, and connect Longwood, I'm sorry, um, and other, and other uh, side streets that get you closer to probabilities of where you want to walk to. So I, I just think, you know, that's, that's an alternative that maybe we didn't explore that maybe um, would be an interesting thing to consider. We actually had, this, I guess on the sidewalk itself, as it goes down Snake Hill there, was seeing if we could do an access to I know that if we got a figure eight trail right now, but if we could even at some point extend that trail to that sidewalk, so you'd have more access to the Hillside Park area. Yeah, we, we did uh, talk a bit about whether there was any uh, wiggle room in this grant to do something a little bit different than just a traditional sidewalk and move it into the into the open space or anything like that. And I think the answer was no. It was more of a, of a in the right of way kind of a project this time. But I think Kurt is correct that uh, while the, the, the figure eight trail does not come out nearly as far as Snake Hill now, uh, I think it, everybody at the Open Space Committee is looking on this as kind of an incremental step. Let's take it this far, see how popular it is, how well used it is, and how much effort might want to be expended for a phase two to bring it out further. Um, and that includes the same, the thought was also discussed at the Open Space Committee of a, of a a walkway going up the other way, up toward Fairmount, more or less opposite Longwood. And uh, that was not part of this project, again, because it was f feeling like that was biting off more than uh, we should at, at a phase one. But it's, it's been thought about. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, John. Anybody have a, else any, have any questions on the uh, consent agenda? Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Mr. Gallup? Yes, too long. Mr. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Schwartz? Yes. Deputy Mayor Sullivan? Yes to all, no to Resolution 2016-195. And 196. And Mayor Ritter? No. Uh, before before that, it's going to be passed. Yeah. Yes. Uh, moving on, we've got two items up for uh, discussion. The first is zoning designation for Chestnut Road R3 versus R4. Anybody have color on this? You want to give the color? Yeah, I, I, can, I can take the lead. Um, I did speak to Tom, and, and he did ask me just to generate a quick map so you know, the picture says a thousand words. Basically, we have an area adjacent to, to Chestnut where the lots are um, small and, and they are more characteristics of, of the R4 zone. And so, um, let me just back up. What, what, what's illustrated on, on this map is I drew a red line which it delineates the R4 zone and then everything around that, that zone is in R3. And then there's an area in blue is where the um, the recommendation and, and discussion with the planning board was to expand the R4 into this blue area into these, um, these lots which are um, substandard for, from the R3 perspective. The R3 being 20,000 uh, square foot lot where the uh, R4 is at only a 10,000 square foot lot. So the R4 is, how big is the R4s? 10,000. And the R3? Is doubles 20,000. And can you give go back and give the color for why this is before us now, John? Uh, we had a um, <coughs> was a resident that came forward and, and 
uh, frankly, was having a very difficult time, um, you know, developing his property because um, being in the R3, it, it, he needed an enormous amount of variances to, to, to do anything on the piece of property. It was the, set, the setbacks, The right? setbacks, yeah. 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 Basically, when you impose the R3 setbacks on an R4 lot, you basically eliminate almost all the building area. So it, it's just not a practical um, application on those particular lots. They're pre-existing lots, and, and when you impose the setbacks, basically every one of those lots have to come in for a variance in order to, to get a, uh, any improvement on the property. When you say improvement, are we talking teardowns? Uh, teardowns or additions, and, and uh, you know, a number of, of uh, a majority of those homes, I haven't plotted the homes, but just knowing the neighborhood, probably most of the homes do extend into the, the, the setback areas. Do we know how many are you? How did this come about? Is like it's one resident came to the planning board and uh, one resident came to the administrator, and yeah. then the administrator, you know, felt that this was something that he would like to bring to the committee and, and discuss the rezoning, only because he recognized that, you know, he even uh, dove into it more than I did regarding what were the the where the houses sit, what the set, the impacts of the setbacks, and, and so basically this, these, these lots are, are severely restricted based when you impose the R3 uh, requirements on them, and it's more practical to impose the R4 because it's just um, trying to get the, the, the lots into a more conforming state. So it looks over on Mountain View, you've got a couple of lots there, 8, 5, and 6, are considerably smaller, at least from the, the visual here, than those in the blue L. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, so three, four, and six. No, eight, eight, five, six, and seven there. On the right in the red area. Okay, yes. Yes. So they're they're zone ten, you're saying? Or is that, I'm reading yeah, that those, those are already in the R four. Ten thousand square feet, correct. So the question John I had is is in the blue area, lot number ten seems to be um, yeah, that lot would be able to subdivide immediately. That, that's, that's, that's one lot. And that was a discussion with the, the planning board. Um, you know, you're looking at the, um, you know, they felt just, just looking at um, being con continuous with the, all the homes on the, that, those lots and just bring that all the way up to Fairmont. And then the lot 16 was not included because the lots, all the lots on Fairmont are basically an R3 to make that consistency on the, on the, on the road that you'd have a consistency of R3. But then when you go into the side street, um, the discussion was that they would then, would then be an R4. And does that resident reside at the 10, 10 lot? Uh, no, he does not. I believe he's on the Fourteen. Fourteen. Is thirteen subdividable as well, just by visual? It's less than uh, twenty thousand. So, okay. well, John, why wouldn't you just keep ten and since ten's next to sixteen, why wouldn't they just keep them in the in the um, R three zone? I mean, they, the issue is the issue is setbacks and things, and that doesn't apply to that because it's it's a, it's a larger size. Yeah. 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 So it seems like they're getting a benefit that. No, by all by all means, that that's the discretion of, of the committee to, to this. It, it went to the planning board. They discussed it. Um, they they just felt that it was to, to be continuous um, on the. When, once you get off of Fairmont, it's, it, the housing stock would look continuous off the roadway. Um, but certainly that, that lot is large enough. And, and the, you know, the, the way the line runs, it does have its jogs and it does change, so it's not a perfect neighborhood section. So certainly uh, that, that would be uh, you know, more questionable why that lot would be included versus you know, the rationale of why we're looking at the smaller lots on Chestnut. The original request was made not Actually, it was actually made to do work on an existing house or to tear down and redo a new house, but not to subdivide. Is that correct? Excuse me? Yeah. The, the original the, request. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, the request was that they, I, I think they are looking to, uh, to tear down, rebuild in that, in that, in 
but not to subdivide. Not to subdivide. Right. That, 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 and that was in lot number 10. That was it was in lot number yeah. 10. And 10 was not uh, an individual, I believe, that approached Tom and, right. and had any discussion. That was just when the, uh, the planner and the planning board discussed this. I wasn't at the meeting at the planning board. Um, when they discussed it, the, the just looking, um, you know, speaking with Tom, they did discuss 10 and 16, and, the, and um, they felt that 10 would be included. That was their well, I think the upshot was that if we were going R4 with the properties that are outlined in blue, and we were going to recode those properties into the R4, that it made sense from a neighborhood perspective, if you will, that to have the ability to subdivide lot 10 would be in keeping with the new, the newly minted R4 along that side Correct. of it's, Chestnut. It's, it's uniform across right. the, the, the road at, at, after you get off of Fairmont. Right, so and so 16 would be unique to that neighborhood, but 16 is actually Fairmount. So right. having the larger space there makes sense. But I, my question, John, I thought that 13 was eligible to be subdivided. 13 is not I'm a 20,000 square foot lot? I'm just looking at the, I just multiplied. I thought it was from our planning board discussions. You know, I mean, I could it's, be wrong. It's a 10,000. It's, it's, you know, it could be subdivided. They can come in for two substandard lots. Right. But it's not going to be a clean sure. subdivision. Mm -hmm. You know, anyone can come in with a variance. Of course. So on any of these given lots that we're talking about here, what's the average square footage on these homes? Do you know? Uh, no, I don't know off the top of my head. I don't, didn't, didn't do that analysis. Do you know what, if under an R3, would they be permis permitted to? I'm just I'm thinking teardowns. Like, are we going to put a huge home on a, a lot that's postage stamp, so to speak? Well, you'd, um, still, you'd still be under the, you'd just be under different zoning. So yeah, you know, I mean, <coughs> If someone wants to tear down their house, it would be no different than tearing down their house uh, yeah, on, a, on a much bigger lot. They'd, they'll be subject to different setbacks, but it'll allow them to do that, right? So right now, they can't do that. Well, I'm saying if you, it's one thing to tear down the house and replace it with a similar size, just in a modern home. It's another thing to tear down the house the size of today and building something twice the size and just... Yeah, but I, I'll let I John speak to it, but I, I think the point is that you'll because the lots in the configuration that they're currently configured, the size of them, it really limits their ability to do anything that it was, it probably should have been R4 zoning all along. Right. And therefore they would be able to do more with their homes. They can't do more with their homes now because they are zoned on a much larger lot yeah. scale that requires much larger setbacks and therefore they're they're not in compliance with anything. They have to. They have to get variances for everything if they want to do anything to their home. If you look at if you look at lot 15, Kurt on Chestnut, mm -hmm. yeah, and then compare it to the R4 lots on Mountain View, mm -hmm. you can see certainly that R that the 15 lot belongs more commensurate with yeah, it's, it's sort of the, five, the R4 four, five, six, properties seven. Yeah. on Mountain View. I mean, right now, if if the 15 lot had to adhere to R3 codes, you couldn't even build a silo, I don't think. I mean, <laughs> seriously, your, your front yard setback would probably make it negative into your rear yard setback. It's just impossible. But to, all of it, to absorb those smaller lots into the R4 would allow the property owners more latitude in their improvements. And certainly, we've seen improvements along Mountain View I think the most significant change between the R3 and the R4 taking away the lot size, but it, it's really a front yard setback because on the R3 you have a, a 50 foot front yard and a 50 foot rear and then you look at these lots that are just over 120 feet long, you're basically having a very narrow area that they can then develop. In the R4, it's 25. Right. So now you've opened up that, that building envelope to something reasonable. So that's really the most significant. Because in, and the rear yard is 45, not 50. So you, it still has a significant rear yard. So can they, put a, can they completely build out on these lots? Absolutely not. They still have to hold to the R4 setbacks. And uh, the side yards are the same in the R3 and the R4 is 15 feet. But the most significant is really the front yard is where they're going to be 
where it's going to be beneficial to these homes, where it's just going to open up that. <coughs> well, I think reason would dictate that those homes that we're looking at in the blue probably never should have been R3 to begin with, right? I think they should have been R4, and it was probably just some 75-year-old glitch that put them in R3 to begin with. Albert, can I ask if any of the residents are here to speak on this, or? All right, uh, y'all here? Oh, please. State your name and address, please. Hey, my uh, John Giuliano, 14 Chestnut Road. Do you have anything to say? Uh, yeah, we're just looking to have the same uh, 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 zoning privilege that other people in town on the same size lot have. We put our house on the market and a builder came and he looked at the house on Mountain View, almost virtually right behind us, and came down, came down here to ask somebody if he could do the same thing and was told no. So that's, that's what started it. So you're, you're two houses away from lot number 10, is that correct? Mm, not lot sure. 14, right? uh, 14 Chestnut. I think it's lot 11, tax-wise. Lot 14 because the house behind you would have been lot 8 and so no it's not exactly behind us it's a couple down on Mountain yeah, View we're slightly off and so that's a similar size of lot 8 off of Mountain View and lot 14 I'm referencing the lot not the address yeah okay and yeah. so you know the, that's where and the is the intention of this builder to come in and tear down the home and build a new one or that's way? yeah I mean we don't have a builder because nobody yeah. will bid on that. We need 50 front and 50 back, and we have only 100. You don't, you, it's literally only 100 deep, so 50 and 50. It's 109, <laughs> exactly, I think. Has this been before the planning board already? Or? It has. It, was, it came before the planning board several, mo several months ago. Uh, I think when it was first... But the last meeting, it was, it was discussed. In depth. It was uh, recently discussed at the planning board. The planning board has uh, voted to recommend that the township committee make the change. Uh, they'll be acting on a resolution at their mes uh, next meeting to uh, formally do that, but they have taken action to recommend this change. Huh. And um, if I understand Tom's, um, yeah, as Tom explained at the planning board, um, his opinion was that these properties were probably meant to be R4 to begin with, and they were probably... It was probably an error that they were put in the R3 zone. And um, I think he said that uh, the houses in uh, the, these affected houses are currently non-compliant as they are already. So you know, even in their existing state, they're non-conforming. So um, you know, for them, as Kevin said, to do anything at all, even you know, adding a front porch, they would need all sorts of variances. All right, that's helpful information. So at this point, the committee Votes on it, it goes back to the planning board. John? It was already referred to the planning board for consideration by the township committee some months ago. Uh, the planning board has voted to recommend that the township committee make the change. So assuming the township committee adopts an ordinance to make the change, the ordinance would then be referred to the planning board for their review. They would have 35 days to review it, which since they've already recommended making the change, it stands to reason that they would continue that philosophy and then the township committee could take action um, at least 35 days later. So um, if the township committee uh, votes to introduce an ordinance at their next meeting, then at the December meeting, we would be able to do a uh, final adoption. No, uh, well, there's, this hearing. is also going to require notice because yes. it's a change in classification of a zone. So you're going to have to give certified notice probably to all of the property owners within 200 feet <coughs> of uh, where the zone change is and perhaps of the entire R4 would have to look at it. Okay. So you need, you need personal uh, certified mail notice. John, do you, uh, you know if any of your other neighbors are aware of uh, this issue or what their thoughts are on this? Or? Uh, Stephen here lives on Mountain View, but has a property that goes through to Chestnut. I, I just happened to notice on one of the, uh, the planning board, I'm sorry, Steve Clemp, 9 Mountain View Road. I'm the 
Lot 10. And I approached Mr. Chicarone to let him know that I think I had a reason why the boundary was drawn the way it was. When our parents bought that property in 1948, they bought two lots. It was lot 10 and 16A. 16A is the back half of what is shown there as lot 10. And we believe that because a fence was along the front of our property, running down Mountain View, and then up along the property line, our next door neighbor, which um, I don't remember their lot, I think it's eight. I think it's lot eight there. The fence originally went all the way back to Chestnut, but it rotted away on the Chestnut side, so we took that part down, and we believe they followed that fence line and then down the center spine of Block 54, and that's how we believe the R4 zone became the R4 zone. There was a cow. <laughs> Something like that. There, was a, there is a rock there, though. And, and that's why the fence, originally when I talked to Mr. Chicarone, I said it, the R4 zone came up Long Hill, and it seemed like it should have crossed Mountain View to Chestnut, and then straight down along the, uh, the north side of Chestnut. It would have made sense because of the smaller lots there. And uh, we believe that's probably why the line turns, fits, and starts, because they didn't understand at the time that it was actually two lots that our parents had there, 10 and 16A. They went around it figuring it must have been a 20,000 square lot. There are six irons in the ground <coughs> on our lot. So it, essentially there are six corners. And that might explain why the drawing was way the way it is now. What was the vote from the planning board on this? I beg your pardon? The vote on the planning board, do anyone know? I don't recall what it was. Okay. Yeah. It wasn't part of the percent attendance, but I believe it was. So there was it was unanimous it seemed unanimous the first time, although we didn't take a recorded vote when it first came before the planning board, it was kind of a consensus that this made this made sense. And so I would mm -hmm. imagine, you know, the vote was the last one. Reflective of that also. Reflective of common sense. I guess I'm looking for a little bit more information before we we vote on it. Um, on the one hand, I, I I think we should try to remove the hurdles that uh, that stand in the way of a homeowner from doing anything logical to their house, uh, and if they now have roadblocks that they can't do anything without having to go the full zoning board route. I mean that seems like a hardship. On the other hand. I'd, I'd hate to look back on it and see that we encouraged overbuilding on small lots that uh, that a developer would would maximize a, an expanded building footprint and uh, while a house that might look fine on a half acre lot or a you know a bigger lot that uh, a developer made a bad choice and we allowed them to do it by uh, by opening up a bigger uh, building footprint than and they shoehorn something in on, on a small lot. So I guess I, I'm looking for some more assurances on that to try to strike a balance between those two things. Are there any conditions you can put on builders in these? No, builder, builders will build to the near the square foot that they can max out on. They'll build it as, as high and as wide and as long. So under, as if we, this is were to be rezoned, what's the largest house you would envision on this, these properties here? Well, we, you still, they're, they're all um, 100 feet, and when you put the setbacks, these are not going to be you know, larger than, than 70 feet wide houses. Um, well, certainly on the lot 15, it's going to be a lot smaller, but when you're looking at 14, 13, 12, those lots, uh, possibly 13 could be wider, but you're looking at um, not an extremely wide house uh, compared to the R, R3 zone. And um, with Width-wise of the house, this would probably be a normal size house of, of, of 30 feet wide. I think it'd be. I think it's going to be not an overburden uh, of, of the property, but it'll, it'll, it'll fit within the setbacks that, that are imposed, which is um, what the developer can do. But square footage, you could guesstimate. We're talking like three, four thousand. Yeah, it'll probably be. Yeah, you know, I would be completely guessing. Uh, um, 
I'm just thinking maybe in, in the uh, three to four thousand, maybe more. Maybe more? Yeah, maybe more. Well, let's see, let's uh, Yarmouth. Uh, John, do you recall Yarmouth Road? What is, is that an R3 zone? Or is that an R4 There's zone? a portion of that that's, uh, that's R4. I thought, yeah, I thought near, near, um, like R5. I would bring it up because that, that's a street where you have small lots where mm -hmm. all of a sudden you've, you've had rather large homes go in conforming with, you know, conforming with the code, conforming right. with the code. Mm -hmm. So, but it, it, you know, it has altered, I, I suppose the, the rest of the street, um, you know, that becomes a question of, well, that's a question of height. If you it's want a houses, that was a question of height, houses right? Houses that are going up. If I am, in fact, personally speaking, if I live in an R4 zone, and as I said, tongue in cheek, if there was an R5, I'm in it. Um, but but the houses that are going in in my neighborhood seem higher than they ever were, because we're a traditionally Cape Cod style house. But for somebody to come in in an R4 and build a 35 foot house is perfectly within their realm. They don't have height restrictions just because it's an R4. Our, our zoning doesn't take into effect a, a blended average of the street, right? So you could have a lot of small old capes, probably the situation on Chestnut uh, or those types of homes. And certainly a builder could come in there and build a What's the maximum height now, John? 30, 30, 30, 35. 30. So could build a th could build a narrow, 35 foot tall house and it would look probably out of place to some of the neighbors. But let's face it, that's that has happened all over Chatham Township, and you know it's a hard thing to regulate unless you start going to to an average blended height on the street. And I don't know how you would do that, John. I don't even know if you can, Albert. But that would require a whole different ordinance and a lot of work. So, so you try to come up with the best code you can, and then you 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 live with it. But this code, as we're looking at it, is only going to judge the footprint of the house no matter what, as opposed to the height, because we don't have any varied height requirements or restrictions, I should say. Okay. I thought John said it was a 35 foot. 35, height. Yeah. exactly. But that doesn't have anything to do with the square footage of the lot. No, correct. The, 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 the height of the house is not dependent on the setbacks. Right, you could build a 35 foot silo. That's what I'm saying, which is about what you get right now if block 15 is an R3. Well, it's not on the agenda for action tonight anyway. No. It's just a discussion item. Uh, would it be possible, John, when, when, when it does come back, mm -hmm. could, instead of a, this large, this whole neighborhood scale map, if we just have the, the immediate affected houses, and could could you show us the uh, the new building footprint that this would allow on uh, on each of these affected properties, and just to help us visualize this? Well, I, I could certainly, with little effort, um, superimpose the tax lines on an aerial, and then put um, setback lines so you can see how the houses, existing houses, fit within the proposed mm -hmm. you know setbacks for the R four and uh, you know, give you that perspective. It's not going to be exact because uh, we're not doing an actual property survey. That's right. Sometimes we give you know, specific notice to neighbors who are affected by our action. So is there, is, would it be a good idea to you know, write letters to the adjoining property owners on Mountain View that were considering this so that they could come and give us their input? Did that not happen at the planning board? I don't think it was advertised or anything. It was just a discussion item. Okay. Before you introduce the ordinance? Or just to be part of the discussion? Part of the discussion. I think we've done it in the past. I think that would be a, a good idea to get their input. Any other thoughts? I'm, I'm not sure what we're trying to accomplish with the footprints you, you, you either you either I mean there are two choices here there's R3 and there's R4 and the question is what makes more sense the question is what it is now what makes more sense and and does it make more sense to convert it to R4 
and and then you we have an existing set of zoning ordinances already, and then you live with them. The height, new housing, new construction, we all have different opinions and emotions about that at times. But at the end of the day, it's just a question of, you know, what's more appropriate for these existing lots. And, and the planning board seems to believe that R4 is more appropriate. Tom seems to believe R4 is more appropriate. I think we could certainly take input from the neighbors. Um, I, I'm just not sure where the footprint gets us. Yeah, I mean, missing zoning, though, taking the, the character of the community into account, not just one particular house. So um, I, mean, I, I think the input of the neighbors in that community would be relevant to whether this is a good idea. Yeah, because as soon as it happens to lot 14, presumably, it's going to snowball down the road. Yeah. Well, I could say that what, what has occurred in that neighborhood, if you look at lot 2, this is, in fact, a, an older um, tax map that I grabbed. It, it's, that was actually subdivided lot two. And it was subdivided into two substandard lots in the R3 zone. And the te planning testimony that they gave, um, and the board accepted, was that they, the, the lot two is more characteristics of the R4 versus R3. So that lot, uh, they did permit that lot to be subdivided as if it was in the R4 zone and, and imposed the R4 setbacks on those two new homes. So the planning board and, and the neighborhood, because they were, you know, there, there was a 200 foot radius around um, that application. And, and I just don't recall that being a very controversial application for the neighborhood themselves. It was just. Um, you know, they certainly had the hurdles of, of the planning testimony to justify what they did, and, and the board did ex 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 acknowledge and accept it. But you know, that's just uh, some history on regarding this neighborhood and, and what has occurred. And I'm not asking for the footprint because I'm opposed to it. I, the planning board recommending it does carry a lot of weight. I guess I'm just thinking that I think if, if I'm going to vote on it, I'd, I'd like to have a clear idea of what I'm voting on. Well, I, I think what you're asking then, or what, what I think would be helpful for you, is the existing footprint of the house and an overlay of what a new footprint yeah. would look both, like. Both the existing footprint well, and, 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 yeah, and an overlay. Because an aerial will show the footprint of where that house stands on the lot right now, and then I can just show, you know, uh, um, quickly based on tax map information, what size house could fit based on the square footage of the tax lot. And uh, you know, just give it something very quick and dirty. Yeah, I think mean, there's the concern, as Mike's saying, is you got to, if it's a postage size lot, you got a McMansion on top of it, it's going to change the dynamic of the entire neighborhood overnight. And before you know it, it'll be going down the street. Uh, and then it'll be a, an exercise that'll also show what the existing house is and what the new house would be. And, and, and perhaps it may be, it may not be as large um, as the, it may not be that much larger than the existing house, but the problem is that the, it's an old stock house. And any builder coming in, they don't want to renovate the house. They want to knock it down. They want to put a new foundation. They want to put new walls. They want nine-foot ceilings. They want, you know, whatever. And, and for them to knock it down, they need, they need to go for a, a variance because you, once you knock the house down, nothing's going to fit on the lot because you put, you're imposing that 50-foot front, 50-foot rear, and then all of a sudden your building envelope is, is, is tiny. It's impractical. So, <laughs> it's impractical. So, so yeah. that might be an interesting perspective to see that, that the, you know, the existing houses may already be sized, that they're not going to, the footprint may not be um, as significant as, as you might think. It may be very similar to what the uh, proposed house would go on that lot. It's just that the builders, you know, are, are, are hamstrung on, on doing anything with that going through. Okay. Well, I guess there's a request for more information, and if we could alert the neighbors as well, and we can discuss this further on the 26th. Uh, two weeks from tonight, so it'll be the uh, 27th. 27. So with that, what would the natural progression be, Albert? Could you walk us through? It, it comes back to us on the 27th. We just have the more information. Do we introduce an ordinance that night? Well, or, it, or? for an ordinance to be inch ready that night, you'd have to give a direction to have the ordinance prepared. But also, you're going to need, I believe, an amendment to the zoning map. Uh, Albert, okay. am so, I mistaken that we need to take that the planning board needs to take further action? Is it already on the table that they're voting on that on the 17th? Well, it's it's on the planning board agenda to vote on the resolution to memorialize what they already decided at the last meeting. Okay. So uh, by, by the 27th, 
uh, the Township Committee will have received a copy of that resolution uh, to make the change as right. presented. Yeah, it's my understanding that we just added an extra step. You know, before you would go to the step of, of drafting an ordinance, we kind of floated this by the planning board to say, hey, do you think this has any merit? And they came back and said, yes, I think you should look at it. So it was really something for the committee to, to consider when they go take their next step. But it does have to go back to the planning board. Right, you don't have to wait. For, if you're asking, do you have to wait for the planning board resolution? You don't. Right. You can give a direction to have an ordinance drafted tonight along with an amendment to the zoning map and that would be ready for next meeting. But once you introduce it, as the clerk said before, it does go back to the planning board, and uh, a minimum of either one of two things have to happen. You have to wait 35 days for the public hearing, or the planning board has to uh, review the ordinance with uh, earlier than 35 days and report back to you. But if there is no meeting of the planning board between that period, then you have to wait the 35 days. And at the end of the year, there may be, you know, questions of timing, but I think the clerk indicated to you how you could meet the, the, the time deadlines because you can't carry an ordinance from one year to the next. Okay. So if it doesn't you introduce it this that. year. If you introduce it this year, you have to adopt it or consider it this year. You can't carry it to 2017. But it doesn't hurt us to have an ordinance on the side ready to go. No, it's, it can be part of your mm -hmm. package. You can see what it says, pending or subject to, Further in discussion. The details and commentary from Correct. members. Do you guys it's want to have one in the queue ready to go? Any issues with that? Sure. All right. But it's it's also an amendment. You're asking the engineer to prepare an amendment to the zoning map. Whatever we need to do. Yeah. Great. Uh, the next item for discussion uh, is bear hunting. Uh, some folks may know that this week is the first week of uh, bear hunting in the state. Uh, the first three days, I believe, are archery or bow and arrow hunting, and then the last part is uh, rifle, shotgun, I believe. Uh, Tom, you know the details? Uh, I don't know the particulars, but I know it's now. It's frozen lake. Yeah, talk to the mic. Like I said, I don't know the particulars. I, I know right now it's bow and arrow season, and it's eventually going to move into the shotgun season. I don't know when that's going to partake. I don't really follow the bear hunt, and that's basically all I know at this point. All right, that's, that's good. <laughs> so the question here is right now, the way I understand the ordinance, we have an ordinance for deer hunting on private property and township property <coughs> to kill deer. We don't have it for bear. So I guess the question is, given the issue of bears in the town, if we want to add another animal to this to this list. And so my question or discussion for the committee is one, if that's something to consider, or two, however, if you have the details, what would it entail for us to add bears to the list of the deer? Well, I, I your if you if your intention is to add bears, um, I'd have to research what the uh, requirements are to be consistent with whatever the state plan is. So you'd want to have an ordinance that, well, let me just backtrack a second. Your ordinance, the way it is written, it prohibits the discharge of firearms and weapons within the municipality. That's the general prohibition. You cannot discharge a weapon or uh, a, fi uh, a firearm or a weapon within the <coughs> municipality. There are exceptions to that one of them is for deer hunting, and uh, it sets forth the conditions under which that exception would apply. Okay? So it's, it really then becomes a question of, will those conditions, they work for deer, will they also work for um, bears? Uh, there is also, at least for deer, uh, there is a 400-foot radius uh, even if you're on private property, if you are going to, if you're within a radius of 400 feet where the deer stand is, you have to have the consent of all those property owners. Uh, and I just simply don't know what the requirements are for bear hunting. I understand your point that the state has made uh, 
for uh, designated an area of the town as, as eligible for bear hunting. The question is how does how do those requirements uh, can be imported or, or, or uh, into your ordinance? Uh, so it's uh, I think first uh, like you said it's a policy decision. Uh, then uh, I would need time to work with the police department to present to you a workable ordinance that meets uh, whatever the hunting requirements are for bear. Okay. Yeah, but the one that comes to mind, as I said, it's, it, even if it's on private property, if you have a small lot, you have to include the consent of, of your neighbors, and there's a procedure for that. Uh, and if you want to allow hunting on uh, municipal property, there's that typically there's a, a process, a bidding process, or some sort of licensing process uh, to allow that and it has to be regulated by the police department because obviously uh, on public property there's going to be other people there that are not hunters. Okay. What is it off the top of your head? 400, within 400 feet of what? 400 feet of a property line? No, 400, 400 I think it's, uh, I, I forget what the requirement is, it's 400 feet either from the stand or from the property line, but there is a 400 feet requirement that if, if you're touching within those 400 feet the proper that property owner that a joint property owner has to give their consent okay. and so currently those folks who go deer hunting they that they can do that today is what it is right they well <laughs> what, what they have to meet whatever the conditions of the existing ordinance are because the general rule as i said is no uh, firearm discharge no weapons discharge except if you meet those conditions. Is that, is that your inter interpretation? That's correct. But it's in place in Chatham Township. For deer? Yes. Okay, so now you'd have to have a second exception for the discharge of firearms and weapons for okay. bears that meets whatever the state hunting requirements are. Okay, because under, uh, for, the, for the deer, the state statute is 400 feet. And obviously, because your 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 shot may extend beyond your your property. Other than controlled hunts that sometimes get authorized, do we even know if anyone actually hunts deer inside Chatham Township? Do we? The, we the actually licenses are state licenses. We actually suspended that a few years back because we had a influx of a death due to a midge fly. So our deer population has been extremely low. So we suspended that deer hunt four or five years ago. So there has not been any deer hunting in the township since then. But the state on the uh, Great Swamp lands or U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, lands, they obviously make it available. Yes, they, they have a That's really what we're talking about, uh, right? I mean, when we're talking about where you can hunt, it's not like you can walk out your backyard in most towns. There's, there's some properties, there's some yeah, properties you can do it, yeah. green, for sure. Green Village. But right now, the Great Swamp is not part of the uh, bear hunt itself. And parts of Chatham Township are now part of the bear hunt. It's a matter of whether or not locally there's an ordinance that allows it, so to speak. Mr. Mayor, I, I think this is if, some, if this is something you want to pursue, I think uh, it's something that probably will not be ready in two weeks. I think it's something that needs to be looked at uh, from me, by me as from the legal perspective and the police department to address some of these uh, practical concerns. Um, so I just don't, I, it's not just amending the ordinance, it's just, just making sure. No, I agree. Right. Well, that's why we have it for discussion. Right. So see what everyone's thoughts are, if it's worth pursuing or. I could use a bear rug. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't see any great need for, I mean, I know there's an occasional bear sighting in town, but I don't know that that, is, <coughs> that is this, assuming that that's a problem, is it, would this be a, 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 a This would be one way of remedy. addressing our bear issue, put it that way. Right now, the bears that are in the town are not perceived to be a nuisance because they have yet to attack an individual and do property damage, though we have seen on many occasions uh, particularly in my neighborhood where this bear has strolled down Huron Drive to a group of children who go running to 
neighbors' homes or children on the bus stop in the morning and a bear comes running down the street, they, not, they don't know what to do and you know, either run to a home or jump in someone's minivan. And we're always told that black bears are docile, and I argue black bears are docile until they're not. Until you pet them. So you know, this is an option to consider to cull these two bears in our, in our township. I wouldn't mind researching it further to see what happens. Uh, I've had one resident actually reach out to me who is an avid hunter, who has a property of considerable size, who has seen the bears in his backyard. And if it's an option for this individual to, if, if, if so permitted, could manage our bear, pro our bear problem in the township, it might be worth considering. That's why I just brought it forth for discussion this evening to see what everyone else thought. Is there any way to know whether these bears are, are living in Chatham Township or whether they're just passing through? Because, I mean, I, <laughs> I mean to, have a, to have a hunt for whatever it would be, one week or two weeks out of the year, it might, we might piggyback on the overall hunt that reduces the total bear population, but... Uh, and no tracking, and talking with the, the DEP and the fish and game folks, you know, they have not tracked these particular bears. I think, you know, maybe visually people could tell if it's the same one that was in New Providence two days ago or the one that was in Harding or, you know, we heard from our bear seminar we had last year, these bears can travel, you know, hundreds of miles. That's my work. understanding, yeah. Uh, you know, they come and they go, but the fact of the matter is, you know, when they come into our neighborhoods, you know, we've got children who go to school now with whistles, you know, in the anticipation that if they see a black bear, they blow the whistle and, you know, strike a stance and, you know, or find shelter. I have no objection to pursuing it, Your Honor. Uh, I'm open to it. Um. It would be worth knowing what it is, I guess. I, I, at, at this point, I, I guess I'm not convinced that a, that a bear hunt in the few properties in Chatham Township that might be big enough to accommodate a hunt would solve the problem of a, of a bear wandering through from a Harding or a New Providence the other 11 and a half months of the year. But, but it might. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be opposed to looking into it. Okay. Do you have any comments, Bob? Do you have any comments to tell? No, sir. And if you want to look into it, it's fine. All right. If you could, Albert, appreciate it. Uh, we'll now open up for a hearing. Thank you, uh, Tom. Open up for a hearing of citizens. Anyone wants to come forward? All right. See no one coming forward. Greg, you want to uh, read his uh, exec session resolution? Resolution 2016-P-15, a resolution of the Township Committee of the Township of Chatham in the County of Morris, State of New Jersey, authorizing conference of the Township Committee with the public excluded, whereas NJSA 10 column 4 12 of the Open Public Meetings Act permits the exclusion of the public from a meeting in certain circumstances, and whereas the Township Committee of the Township of Chatham is of the opinion that such circumstances presently exist, now, therefore, be it resolved by the Township Committee of the Township of Chatham, uh, County of Morris, State of New Jersey, as follows. The public shall be excluded from discussion of the specified subject matter. The general nature of the subject matter to be discussed is as follows. Litigation in the matter of the Township of Chatham for a judgment of compliance of its third round housing element and fair share plan. Docket number MRS-L-1659-15 and uh, property ag acquisition or investment options open space. It is anticipated that the minutes on the subject matter of the executive session will be made public upon conclusion of the matter under discussion and in any event when appropriate pursuant to NJSA 10 colon 4-7 and 4-13. The committee will come back into regular session and may take further action. This resolution shall take effect immediately. Thank you. Motion to approve. Second. Or second. Second. Mr. Gallup? Yes. Mr. Kelly? Yes. Mrs. Schwartz? Yes. Deputy Mayor Sullivan? Yes. Mayor Ritter? Yes.